Thank you for downloading this episode of Case Notes. Case Notes was recorded at the Royal College of Physicians of Edinburgh as part of the Edinburgh History of Medicine seminar series. You can get news of our latest events if you follow us on Twitter at RCP Heritage. We hope you enjoy the talk. Thank you very much. Uh, good evening, everyone. It's uh, a real pleasure to be, uh, to be here today. Um, so I'm going to, my lecture, I'm, a, I'm a, a, a medic rather than a historian, so naturally I'm going to uh, concentrate more on the, uh, the clinical aspects of diabetes. But what I want to do is to give you a, a flavour of how uh, the treatments of diabetes have changed over the, uh, over the years and uh, highlight why that is now relevant particularly relevant for us today in trying to ensure that we get the correct diagnosis uh, in people with, uh, with diabetes. So diabetes, or diabetes mellitus, to give it its, uh, its proper uh, title, is very, very easy to diagnose. All you need to do is to take a, a blood sample from someone and show that their sugar level is elevated, and you've made the diagnosis. If I'd been standing here 200 years ago, the diagnostic procedure was slightly different uh, in that instead of taking a blood sample, uh, you would have got a sample of urine from the, from the patient. And the, the doctor would have tasted the urine to see if the urine was sweet. Thank goodness things have moved on in the last 200 years. I'm not quite sure I could quite handle, uh, handle doing that. So making a diagnosis of diabetes mellitus is very, very easy. But the, the differential diagnosis in terms of the underlying causes of diabetes mellitus is very broad indeed. And that's where the, the diagnostic difficulty can occur. So in numerical terms, the, by far and away the most common form of diabetes is type 2 diabetes. Then you get type 1 diabetes, which makes up around about 10% of all cases in the United Kingdom. And then you get some real uh, rarities, uh, which we call, we lump together as the so-called monogenic or genetic forms of diabetes. Now, type 1 diabetes is uh, uh, what we call an autoimmune condition. So basically, in, in type 1 diabetes, your body attacks itself. And in the case of type 1 diabetes, it's attacking, oops, it's easy. It's attacking um, these cells here, which are called the islets. So this is a slide taken from the pancreas gland. Now, the pancreas gland is a, a funny gland in that it makes uh, all the uh, digestive enzymes that we use to break down uh, food after we've eaten it. And those are secreted directly into the, into the bowel. But the pancreas gland also makes hormones that go into the bloodstream, and predominantly amongst these is insulin. And what happens in type 1 diabetes is that you get an attack on the islets within cells of the immune system that effectively destroy the insulin-producing cells. And so what that means is that people with type 1 diabetes have an absolute deficiency of insulin. Or rather, that's the standard textbook teaching. And so people with type 1 diabetes need treatment with insulin, and that is a lifelong treatment. Now, we can measure in people with type 1 diabetes markers of this autoimmune process, this process of destruction of the pancreas uh, by, the, um, by the immune system. And we can measure antibodies in the blood. Type 1 diabetes classically presents in people of young age, so people in uh, childhood, in uh, early adulthood. So if this young chap came along and saw me and had a high blood sugar level, it would be virtually, but not absolutely certain, that he had type 1 diabetes. Martin mentioned that, um, that in, in the past, the presence or absence of ketones was used by clinicians to work out what type of diabetes somebody has. And in fact, we still do that today. So if somebody has got ketones in their blood or urine, that absolutely pushes you down uh, a diagnostic path for type 1 diabetes. 
Ketones are important because they are an alternative energy source for our cells. So people with type 1 diabetes, the sugar is in their blood, but it can't get into the cells. And so the cells are starved of energy. And so ketones are made as an alternative source of energy. Type 2 diabetes, as I said, is by far and away the commonest form of, uh, of diabetes. Type 2 diabetes is predominantly a genetic condition. So 65% of all susceptibility that we have to developing type 2 diabetes is inherited from our parents. But it's not one single gene, it's not one single genetic abnormality that confers susceptibility to type 2 diabetes. There's, there are probably over 200 genes that confer susceptibility uh, to type 2 diabetes. And we all have these genes, but we just have little variations in the genes that make us just a little bit more or a little bit less susceptible to get type 2 diabetes. Type 2 diabetes is not associated with a lack of insulin. People with type 2 diabetes generally make lots of insulin. It's just that the insulin does not work properly. They have what is called insulin resistance. So the insulin, when it binds to the cells, just doesn't elicit an effect. There are very strong associations with, with type 2 diabetes with increasing age. So classically, people with type 2 diabetes present in middle age and older years. And there is a strong association with, um, uh, with body uh, weight. So people who lay down fat, particularly around their tummy, are more susceptible to get type 2 diabetes. And there's a strong uh, racial element to type 2 diabetes. So people of uh, South Asian or Afro-Caribbean heritage are at much higher risk of getting type 2 diabetes. People with type 2, type 2 diabetes classically make no ketones and make no antibodies uh, uh, against the pancreas. And the monogenic forms of diabetes are rare. They make up about 1 to 2% of all uh, diabetes. And these are single gene abnormalities. So you inherit one faulty gene from one of your parents, and that makes you uh, liable to get diabetes. And this was the, the family uh, from Nottinghamshire where uh, monogenic diabetes was first identified in the 1970s. And the, the figures over each member in the wedding photo is the age at which they developed diabetes. Now, there are many different forms of monogenic diabetes that affect many different uh, genes. And depending on which gene you've inherited, it may be possible for you to be treated with tablet forms of uh, treatment. Now, Martin mentioned um, the show, the, Martin's very first slide was the slide showing the average life expectancy of diabetes um, um, in the, the first half of the, of the last century. And if, if we'd all been here 100 years ago, so in uh, 1919, I would have said to you that either of those uh, children who were in the, uh, in the slides there had an average life expectancy of about two years. These were children who had been diagnosed with diabetes. And at that stage, diabetes, what we now know as type 1 diabetes, was a terminal illness. It had, a, pro, it had a, a life expectancy much shorter than most cancers that we see today. So type 1 diabetes was a lethal, lethal condition. And then these guys came along. The, this is Frederick Banting uh, on your right and Charles Best on, uh, on your left. And I would love to tell you the this, this story of what these guys got up to in Toronto and Canada in 1921 is worth about three lectures in its own right. And I would love to tell you the story, but I don't have time to tell you the story. But it is an amazing story that tells, shows you the best and absolutely the worst of uh, human um, personality and uh, uh, endeavours. But these guys were the, the ones who discovered insulin, or rather, they managed to isolate insulin, initially from the pancreas glands of dogs, and then laterally from the pancreas glands of, uh, of cows, pancreas glands that they got from the, abat from the local abattoir in Toronto. But these guys were amazing, and they, they discovered insulin, and uh, insulin in the aftermath became available for the treatment of type 1 diabetes. 
And although, as Martin said, it was thought that this would tra completely transform uh, the life of people with diabetes, it wasn't by any means perfect. And life expectancy for people with type 1 diabetes in the, in the first half of the 20th century was still very, very short indeed, because the insulin treatment was imperfect. But there's no doubt that over the intervening 100 years, the, the quality of the insulin that we have available has improved immeasurably, but it remains imperfect. There is no way that injections of insulin can mimic the finely tuned um, system in our pancreas glands that exists in people who do not have diabetes. So insulin is amazing, but it's not perfect. Now Martin said I would show you some uh, instruments of torture, and these are uh, some of the devices that were used in the management of type 1 diabetes last century. That's a, a glass uh, syringe. This is a, a device that allowed for people who were struggling to inject themselves. This effectively uh, device fired the insulin syringe, bang, right into the top of your leg or the top of your arm. Um, so there's no doubt that the way we have to deliver insulin has improved immeasur immeasurably uh, over the last 100 years. This is the, the very first insulin pen made by a company called Novo Nordisk, uh, who are based in, in Denmark. But actually, the original idea for the insulin pen was a Scottish idea. It came from two uh, Scottish uh, clinicians, Ireland working in, uh, in Glasgow, and uh, Sheila Reith, uh, who uh, spent most of her career in Stirling. And they came up with the idea of the insulin pen. And again, over the, uh, over the last 20 or 30 years, insulin pen technology has improved enormously. The gold standard, though, for uh, giving insulin these days, though, is by a pump device. This is the very first insulin pump, which it almost looks as though it's one of these rocket um, pack things, you know, for flying up into, into the sky. So this was invented by a, a very astute clinician working in London called John Pickup uh, in the early 1970s. And you can see that it was not the most practical of uh, insulin delivery uh, uh, devices. So this is the current insulin pumps, or one of the current insulin pumps that we have. So insulin is um, loaded into a syringe in the, in the device, and uh, it gives the insulin via a giving set into the uh, tissues just under the skin, usually of the, of the abdomen. And this is, this is a very, very good way of delivering insulin uh, to people with type 1 diabetes. But it's not perfect, far from perfect. This is one of the very first uh, blood glucose uh, monitors. So one of the mainstays of monitoring diabetes is the finger prick testing uh, of blood. Uh, and that came in in the 1970s. This, I have to say, really looks like an instrument of torture, but it was actually one of the early finger pricking devices. So you would put your finger underneath the, uh, the little yellow piece of plastic there, press the red button at the top, and the guillotine would come down, bang, and would uh, prick your finger. I, I can't imagine genuinely the courage that it must have taken to have your finger under that, waiting for that device to come down uh, and prick your finger. But, but finger pricking, intermittent blood testing of, diabetes, uh, of blood sugar levels, is not perfect. And it's not perfect because people with type 1 diabetes have got enormous variability in their blood sugar levels on a day-to-day -day basis. So the graph here, the, the heavy line, is the average blood sugar level for this one individual. It's not bad. It's pretty good average overall. But each of the individual uh, graphs that you see, and there's about 20 of them overlaid here, are individual 24-hour tracings from uh, that same person. And you can see that sometimes her blood sugar level is up here, and sometimes it's down there. And it's just swinging like a yo-yo up and down. 
And you can see the problem with finger prick testing. Even if you're testing a finger pricking four, five, six times a day, just depending on when you do the test, it might be here, but then 10 minutes later, it might be up here, and you don't know that because just of the nature of the timing of your, uh, of your blood test. So finger pricking is not perfect. This is getting pretty good, though. So this device here is called a, a Freestyle Libre device, and it's worn usually in the skin of the upper arm. And this is a continuous glucose monitor. So this monitors blood sugar levels constantly over a 24-hour period and um, can be worn for two weeks at a time. This is an amazing device. It costs about £65 for the two weeks. Believe you me, it's worth every penny of that and more because it gives the person with diabetes so much more information about what their sugar levels are doing. This graph here is uh, stolen from my friend and colleague Fraser Gibb, who's a consultant at the Royal Infirmary. And uh, Fraser uh, audited the impact of introducing the Freestyle Libre at the Royal Infirmary Diabetes Clinic. Um, the Freestyle Libre device became available on prescription last year in Lothian. And so we were able to start giving it to people with type 1 diabetes on prescription. And um, you don't need to worry so much about the, the numbers inside here, but basically the green bars are people uh, before they got the Libre, and the, sorry, the, the, gra the cluster of, on the left are people before they got the Libre, and this is uh, people after they got the Libre. The green bars are people with uh, good control, average control, and not good control. So you can see that after the Libre was introduced, the proportion of people with, with suboptimal sugar control fell from 20% to, uh, to just under 10%. And that's with a monitoring device. That's an amazing, amazing improvement. I think this is one of the biggest improvements in diabetes care in the whole of the last 50 years. It's an amazing device. There are other forms of continuous glucose monitoring now. And what the, the holy grail now is getting the continuous monitors to talk to the insulin pumps and switch the pump off if your sugars are going low and switch the pump back on as your sugars are going uh, high again. And that technology now exists. So this is the, the current system uh, that's uh, available uh, called the 670G hybrid closed loop system. And this device, if uh, somebody with type 1 diabetes wears this, it can absolutely transform their sugar control. The problem with this, though, of course, is the cost. This is very expensive technology. Now, I'm obviously hugely biased, and I think, again, this is worth every single penny uh, the, the transformative effect this can have for the person living with type 1 diabetes is immeasurable. And uh, the impact for uh, that person as well in reducing the risk of complications of diabetes is enormous. And that then, of course, feeds through to, to benefits to us all in terms of reduced health care costs of diabetes. But this is a challenge for governments, not just in Scotland, but across the, um, uh, the whole of the world in being able to provide this um, technology. And of course, I'm talking here about, um, uh, about um, resource-rich uh, countries. There's absolutely no chance in the world that this technology could be afforded in resource-poor countries. It's impossible. And of course, that's one of the, the great world inequalities that we have in healthcare. But this, this is absolutely the future of type 1 diabetes in, in my book. Th this, I think, will transform everything. So this is what's called the bionic pancreas or the dual hormone pump. So this pump has actually got two uh, syringes in it. One syringe has got insulin in it, like a standard insulin pump. But the other syringe has got another hormone in it called glucagon. Now, glucagon is the mirror image of insulin, and it does the opposite. So glucagon raises your blood sugars, whereas insulin lowers your blood sugar levels. So what this pump does 
is incredible. It's, it's a bit like driving a car with one foot on the brake and one foot on the accelerator. So with this pump, as your sugar levels are going high, it just gives you a bit more insulin. And if your sugar levels are going low, it drops down your insulin and gives you a bit more glucagon. The best thing about this pump is that the human element is taken out of it entirely. So with this pump, you literally put it on and you forget about it. There's no carbohydrate counting. There's no working out how much insulin that you have to, to have. It's, 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 it's astonishing. But it's not available yet. They're still testing it. But I, it will come. I have no doubt uh, at all about this. This will come. This will be a major, major, major advance. But guess what? It's going to be really expensive. And that will be the problem uh, with this. We can also transplant um, islet cells. So the, the cells that make insulin can be transplanted into uh, someone with, uh, with diabetes. They're taken from uh, the pancreas gland of a deceased person, so it's a form of organ transplantation. And this is performed in Edinburgh. It's one, Edinburgh is the, the Scottish National Centre for Islet Transplantation. And for a tiny, tiny uh, minority people with type 1 diabetes, this can be uh, a life-transforming treatment. But it's not for everyone. You have to take very powerful immune-suppressing drugs. And um, it, 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 it's not a treatment for the future, I don't think. Um, there may be a, an option of having... Uh, stem cells that you then don't have to take um, islet, uh, to have to take the immune suppressants. But the problem with this is you're injecting the cells into the liver and you're just injecting the cells in the wrong place. Uh, and so I don't see this as being a, 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 a real player in the future. It's going to be technologies. Now, what about type 2 diabetes? So Type 2 diabetes, again, the therapeutics of type 2 diabetes have moved forward massively over the last 10 years, even. Type 2 diabetes, it, 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 it's, it's a total joy now to be seeing people with type 2 diabetes. And I don't mean that in a negative way. What, what I mean by that is that we've got so much more to offer now in terms of treatment than we did in the, in the past. But actually, the most important aspect of the management of type 2 diabetes remains diet. So type 2, most people, the overwhelming majority of people with type 2 diabetes will have a degree of central uh, ad, uh, adiposity, weight around the, the middle of their tummy. And if you can lose that weight, you can actually put your type 2 diabetes into remission. That's been shown on TV programs like the Fast Fix, but it's been shown in big research studies uh, one just published uh, a few weeks ago. So you can put type 2 diabetes into remission if you can lose enough weight. The problem is that, of course, it's very difficult for any of us to lose weight. We all find, you know, we all progressively put more weight on as we get older. That's just what happens as we get older. And we all find it very, very difficult to lose weight. So to say to somebody with type 2 diabetes, OK, we need to get you to lose 15 kilograms in weight, is a really, really, really big ask uh, for someone. But if you can do it, it can be, again, transformative. We've also got really, really good new treatments, though. Um, there's one class of drugs that makes you pee out called the SGLT2 inhibitors. Don't worry about all these, the stuff in these slides. I just needed something to put on a, on a slide to allow me to talk about it. But SGLT2 inhibitors are amazing because they make you pee out sugar in your urine. So the same thing that happens in people at the time of diagnosis, we're actually now inducing therapeutically. This is really good because if you lose the sugar in your urine, you lose it then from your blood, so it lowers your blood sugar levels. By losing sugar in your urine, you also lose calories. You lose about three to 400 calories a day in your urine by taking these drugs, so it helps people lose weight. So it, again, affects the underlying cause of the diabetes as well. The GLP-1 agonist treatments, these are injection treatments, usually given once a week now, and they, again, help uh, people 
lose weight. They have an effect on the appetite centers of our brain. They make you feel a bit fuller so you don't eat so much. And they also give you a turbo boost on your pancreas to make you produce more insulin. So these drugs are amazing and there are more and more of these drugs coming, uh, coming on site. We can also do surgery for di type 2 diabetes, so-called bariatric surgery. Most bariatric surgery involves procedures where you cut out part of the, of the stomach so you feel fuller after you've had a meal. These treatments are astonishingly um, effective. People can lose 20, 30 kilograms in weight with these uh, treatments. But it's a big operation. It's a big operation for somebody with diabetes, for somebody who may be overweight, to go through that operation. So again, this is only ever going to be a treatment for a tiny, tiny proportion of people. The more effective uh, 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 options in the future for type 2 diabetes will come through drugs. Drugs rather than surgery, I would predict. Now, this is Sophie. Sophie's a nurse. Sophie was diagnosed with type 1 diabetes when she was seven years old. I think it would be fair, to say, Sophie would be the first to say that uh, when she was diagnosed with diabetes, she found it very difficult to manage her diabetes, as so many people with type 1 diabetes do. And her control through her adolescent years, through her young adulthood, was not good. And Sophie now has complications of, of diabetes. She just had an eye operation last week. And I got to know Sophie um, uh, when she was pregnant. Um, and this was Sophie's blood sugar levels um, during pregnancy. Now, Sophie was on an insulin pump. And you can see it's very like that graph I was showing before. Each black dot is a blood sugar level. And her sugar levels are just all over the place. Sophie's doing everything humanly possible to get good control of her diabetes. But it's just a nightmare for her. We were notified uh, during pregnancy that Sophie's father, who had type 2 diabetes, actually had been found to have a rare genetic form of diabetes. And so we tested Sophie, and Sophie had that form of genetic diabetes as well. So Sophie never had type 1 diabetes. Sophie had, we'd misdiagnosed Sophie, or she'd been misdiagnosed in the 1990s when she was first uh, uh, diagnosed with diabetes and Sophie actually always had a genetic form of diabetes now the reality is for the clinicians who were involved when Sophie was first diagnosed in the 1990s these rare genetic forms of diabetes had barely been heard about and were not things that were being routinely considered at the time of diagnosis but Sophie's form of genetic diabetes was such that we could manage her with tablets and this is Sophie's blood sugar levels on a tablet. And you take it from me that her sugar levels are essentially now normal. She has normal blood sugar levels. So as a consequence of making the correct diagnosis, we've got Sophie on the correct treatment for her diabetes, and we've now given her near-perfect sugar control. And this is something that we increasingly recognize is very, very important. 20 or 30 years ago, the, the options for the treatment of diabetes of any form were pretty limited. It was, if you type 2 diabetes, there was one, tab, one or two tablets that we could give, and then bang, you were on to insulin. And for type 1 diabetes, you were on insulin from the word go. So it didn't really matter a great deal if we did not get the diagnosis absolutely spot on. But now it really does matter because the management of type 1 diabetes is completely different now from the management of type 2 diabetes and is certainly very different from the management of genetic diabetes. So as a diabetes team, we were extraordinarily upset when uh, we made the genetic diagnosis in Sophie. We were, we were happy, delighted, that she was now getting a, a transformative treatment but we were upset that we had never thought that she had any other form of diabetes other than type 1 diabetes. And the reality is that if she'd been on tablets from the word go, she would have never developed complications of, uh, of diabetes. Here's somebody else whose uh, the diagnosis uh, of diabetes was made erroneously. 
So Theresa May, you can see her there proudly wearing her uh, Freestyle Libre device. Theresa May was diagnosed with type 2 diabetes. She was diagnosed with type 2 diabetes because she's an older woman, and older people get type 2 diabetes. Young, uh, older people don't get type 1 diabetes. Well, of course, that's nonsense. There is no age limit to when somebody might get type 1 diabetes. So uh, Theresa May endured a year of terrible control of diabetes on tablets until she was, the, the penny dropped. It was realised that she had type 1 diabetes and she was put on insulin. I would shudder to think what her sugar control has been like over the last year, though, I have to say. So why do we make things wrong? You know, I'm just I'm running over time, but can you give me another five minutes? Is that okay? Why do we make the, the diagnosis, uh, why do we get the diagnosis wrong in people with diabetes? Well, we get the diagnosis wrong because the criteria that we use are imperfect. So age at diagnosis, as I've just shown, is an imperfect criteria. Yes, most people with type 1 diabetes get it when they're young, but you can get it when you're older as well. And similarly, we're seeing type 2 diabetes now develop in uh, kids in their teenage years. There's no reason why somebody is, who is overweight cannot develop type 1 diabetes. And similarly, there's no reason why someone of South Asian origin cannot get type 1 diabetes. So the criteria that we use are imperfect. Even ketosis, I've always believed that if you've got ketones in your urine or your blood, you've got type 1 diabetes. Actually, that's not true. People, particularly of Afro-Caribbean origin, can get ketones and they've got type 2 diabetes. And we're not very, or we've traditionally not been very good at measuring antibodies in people at the time of diagnosis. So what we decided to do at the Western was measure a hormone called C-peptide in all our people coming to the clinic with type 1 diabetes. C-peptide is um, made at the same time as insulin is made. And so it gives a measure of how much insulin you make yourself. So insulin in a bottle, insulin in a pump, doesn't have C-peptide in it. And so the theory goes that people with type 1 diabetes will have no C-peptide at all because they don't make any insulin at all. Whereas people with type 2 diabetes will have very high levels of C-peptide because they make lots of insulin and it just doesn't work properly. So we measured, we've measured now C-peptide in, in 757 of the 953 people with type 1 diabetes that come to the Western Clinic. And just over 100 of them, just under 14%, have got high levels of C-peptide, over 200. Now, these are people we believe have got type 1 diabetes. Now, in fact, most of those 103 people actually do have type 1 diabetes. But it's funny type 1 diabetes. And this is one of the things that the C-peptide program has taught us, is that type 1 diabetes is not a homogeneous condition. There are some people with type 1 diabetes that carry on making insulin for many years after diagnosis. And actually, if you've got type 1 diabetes and carry on making a bit of your own insulin, you generally get better control and fewer complications. We found that 27 people who we thought had type 1 diabetes actually have got type 2 diabetes. And we've identified nine people with um, genetic forms of diabetes not, uh, not all of them the same as Sophie's, different forms, but, but single gene um, abnormalities. And we've got 12 people actually have come off insulin treatment completely. Now, these numbers don't sound massive, but I can tell you, if you're one of the 12 people that's come off of insulin, that's a life-transforming thing for you. And um, if you translate these numbers up onto a population scale, then you're looking at an, you know, substantial numbers of people um, worldwide. I'm going to tell you three very brief stories if uh, Ian doesn't uh, 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 shut me down. Alan got learning difficulties. He was diagnosed with type 1 diabetes at the age of 61 because he presented with ketoacidosis. So it was an easy diagnosis for us to make. Now for the last um, eight years, Alan has had district nurses going in every single day to give him insulin injections. Now, if you think of the cost to the NHS of nurses going in every day to administer insulin. Eight years after diagnosis, we measured his C-peptide. It was very high. 
So actually, Alan didn't have type 1 diabetes. Alan's always had type 2 diabetes. And Alan is now on tablets and a weekly injection, and the district nurses go in just once a, once a week. Enormous cost saving. And of course, for Alan, he's now no longer on insulin injections. He's not got any risk of getting low blood sugar levels. This is Yurgita. Yurgita was diagnosed with type 1 diabetes when she was 14. We measured her C-peptide, it was 670. Her antibodies were negative, and we did a genetic screen, and she was, had, um, uh, was positive for a, an abnormality in that gene there. On the day I took that photo of Yurgita, I was slightly uncomfortable taking the photograph, because it's very difficult as a 50-year-old man asking a 24-year-old uh, a young woman in clinic if I can take a photo of her um, but I took that photo and uh, that day I gave her a prescription for this tablet called glycoside and she stopped taking insulin that day she's not been on it since so 10 years after a diagnosis we've got made the right diagnosis we've got her on the right treatment she's got amazing uh, control and here's Callum now Callum's very interesting Callum is uh, a student, a student at Heriot. What? He was diagnosed with type 1 diabetes when he was 12. Now, Callum had one very weakly positive antibody, and his other ones were negative. And when I saw Callum in the clinic initially, when I saw that C-peptide of 800, I was sure, like your Gita and like Sophie, that he was going to have a genetic form of diabetes. But actually, we, did, we screened him for everything, and it was negative. And in fact, Callum has type 1 diabetes. But this is just super weird type 1 diabetes. Because Callum, even um, six years after diagnosis, is making stacks of insulin. So we've now managed to get Callum off of, uh, off of insulin. I've said to Callum, I don't know how, what the future will hold for you, Callum. Um, and it may be that you will eventually have to go back onto insulin injections. But he said, well, look, Mark, if I can even get one or two years off of insulin, I will grab that and take it with, uh, with both hands. This is very cost effective. The C-peptide blood test costs six pounds, and the annual cost of uh, Sophie's glycoside tablets is six pounds as well. I didn't make that up. But to the point of the diagnosis, we made the diagnosis of genetic diabetes in Sophie, it had cost the NHS, in current terms, £35,000. And if we'd not made the diagnosis of genetic diabetes in Sophie, her diabetes treatment over the next 40 years would have cost the NHS £108,000. So Sophie pays for everything in terms of our whole programme of uh, C-peptide testing. And this is my last slide, and I'm sorry, Ian, for horribly overrunning. This is Sandy. Sandy was diagnosed with type 1 diabetes in 1964. I reckon Sandy's had 45,000 injections of insulin over the last 55 years. So we measured C-peptide in Sandy. Guess what? It was detectable. And guess what? He's got a genetic form of diabetes. He's got a genetic form of diabetes that is amenable to treatment with tablets. I have to say, it was a very uncomfortable conversation that I had with Sandy. Difficult to explain that. All I could say to him was, in 1964, nobody would heard of this at all. None of this was known about. But what we need to do is ensure that there are no more Sandys uh, going forward. So one of the things that we're doing is now hoping to roll out the whole C-peptide testing program to the rest of Scotland, and I would hope ultimately uh, to the rest of the United Kingdom. So there we are. That's my story. There's Sandy story. Thank you. Thank you for listening to our History of Medicine lecture series, Case Notes. This podcast has been brought to you by the Royal College of Physicians of Edinburgh. We're a charity, and if you enjoyed today's show, head over to rcpe.ac.uk backslash heritage for more information and how to donate. Thank you.